Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I'll be brief since we've only got about an hour here. Uh, I'm Kale Passmore, uh, pronouns they, them, he, him, from the University of Saskatchewan and the SIGCHI AC for Equity. Um, I'm just going to review the code of conduct real quick while everyone else is still coming in. So we'll post a link to that in the chat here. And to hit on a couple points, uh, we encourage you to add your pronouns um, if you're comfortable doing so after your name in Zoom. Um, we also encourage you to use your camera if possible for ease of comprehension and lip reading. The session will be recorded, so keep your comments concise. That's also to make space for other people during this little session here. Um, as always, we encourage constructive criticism and critique, but in doing so, just be hard on systems and soft on each other. We're all people here, we're all volunteers. Um, we're all working toward the same ends, but with some very complicated systems. So be patient, show sensitivity to anyone speaking, be kind and supportive. Um, and as a reminder, people's lived experiences are not up for debate. Their ideas, um, policies, their suggestions are, um, and the lines between those, not always clear. So when in doubt, give each other the benefit of the doubt. Um, great sensitivity and validation go a long way toward creating community. And that is really what we need first and foremost. So um, to that end, just keep in mind that everyone, um, not everyone has access to the same bodies of knowledge or communities that you might. There are differences between us and material limits that need to be respected, even if you disagree with them. Make sure that your microphone is turned off when um, you are not speaking uh, and raise your hand if you wish to speak and you'll be called on. Um, when you do, please begin by stating your name, pronoun and institution to accommodate those who can't visually identify you. Um, feel free at any point to leave the talk, move around, um, take a moment to yourself if needed. And in the event that anything comes up um, or is personally difficult, if there's discrimination or harassment by another attendee or a presenter or myself, um, you can directly message me or Neha or um, I see Michael Mueller and Kata Spiel in the room here. Um, so we have some SIGCHI CARES representatives as well. So with that said, shall we begin? Um, we are here to gather experiences, thoughts, and potential solutions for hybrid um, events, namely conferences. It's a, this is sort of a way to transparently communicate to conference leadership what we're aware of, and it's a request for your help in creating a wholesome hybrid conference experience, the best that's like possible <laughs> in this day and age. So thinking of hybrid conferences as a permanent adaptation in our circumstances, we're here to figure out the things that we need to change with how we've done both in-person and virtual events thus far. So we know that people widely support events going hybrid, um, and that's likely because it represents the best of both virtual and in-person world. Today, we want to unpack this further. Um, each attendance type offers its own pros and cons, permissions, restrictions, and long-term consequences. Each attendance type has groups that it serves better, groups it serves worse, and larger systematic, yeah, systemic factors at play. Um, equitable diversity does require us to sit with those uncomfortable tensions where no solution uh, works for everyone. Um, but what's currently important is coming together to serve all of SIGCHI's communities uh, better today than we did yesterday, which is directly in line with our SIGCHI values here. Um, hybrid conferences can work for more of our community because they can provide more options and more opportunities for community members to consent. Um, no matter the number of our community who prefers in-person or who prefers digital platforms, greater options to which we can consent is, I think, the best way forward. But we need to deliver the best experience that we can for the options that we introduce. Um, this is where y'all come in. There's, yeah, as I said, relative unity around hybrid conferences being a better option. Um, but the tensions and concerns that we're seeing are around how hybrid conferences can be done. We're uncovering tensions around the ways that hybrid conferences can increase some inequities while reducing others. And that's hopefully what y'all can help us sort of disentangle and sort of make better and find mutual solutions to. So to recap real quick, <laughs> we're here to discuss and relate items flagged around in-person, digital and hybrid conferences across SIGCHI um, for communication to conference leadership. 
We're here to reflect what we've learned from the community so far, from conference chairs, from steering committees, and other EC members um, who've had dialogues with you know, one another and the community at large. Uh, and we're here to identify mechanisms for creating positive hybrid conference experiences. So I know I've been talking a lot, I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna review very quickly <laughs> some of the data that we gathered from one survey, uh, which was the CHI 2020, 2022 um, survey on hybrid conferences and use this as a sort of example of where some of our community sits um, so far where it comes to hybrid conferences. So the general chairs conducted a survey last month to discern the feasibility of a hybrid CHI conference. And we learned that of about 931 respondents, 487 or 52% were keen to attend CHI 2022 in person. An overview of findings was presented by the chairs um, in the town halls conducted in cooperation with the EC. Um, Neha will post some links to session A and session B there. The quant uh, quantitative data indicated that 9% of these 487 respondents um, that were keen to have all of the options, which included you know, masks, distancing, vaccine mandates, and on-site testing, 46% um, of that group said that they valued social, like felt were very, <laughs> felt social distancing and mask mandates were very important. And 16% said that they wanted social distancing, masks, and vaccines combined. So we're thankful for the chairs for sharing that data with us so we can look at the qualitative feedback uh, provided by over 100 respondents. Um, and these respondents pointed out a list of additional concerns. And that's what I'm about to go over in brief. Um, so although these findings that I'm about to speak to come specifically from Kai, we really wanna start this conversation um, with the community to bring us to how multiple types of conferences can be shaped. This isn't about Kai. Um, we are in support of the general chairs on the decisions that they're making and holding them to making that best sort of conference. We have an opportunity here to gather a lot of data and help shape future conferences um, in this sort of way. So why do people vote for in-person experiences? Um, a couple of the major themes that we saw from the qualitative data there was that this was due to poor online experiences with conferences in the past and a general disbelief that these events can be done well. Um, this was due to a need for networking, which they felt could not be done online. Most research takes place in isolation. Um, In-person conferences are one of the few instances that allow them to connect. There are anxieties that are associated with online presentations. Um, the cost of making a mistake is higher when touch points are fewer, things have to be recorded. Um, there's less opportunity for sort of interaction, correction, yeah, addressing the work that we've put so much time into. Um, platforms were hard to navigate. It's unclear who to ask for help. Um, accessibility options range platform to platform. Um, another theme was that virtual events can be access inaccessible for some due to time zones, constraints at home, challenges uh, getting their universities to cover or to fully allow them that time off. That applied to professors, presenters, students, uh, student volunteers. Um, there are also practical issues where it's hard to take time off at home when the conference is virtual. Not all aspects can be virtually simulated um, and time zones are hugely limiting and regionally discriminating. So there were multiple themes as well uh, around, just one second. Um, yeah, why people voted for virtual conferences. One of the largest was that there's a lower risk of transmission um, of illness due to being immunocompromised slash caring for those who are, um, travel restrictions. So policy-wise, um, this was also cumbersome from flying quarantine um, concerns. Uh, it's, things are so unpredictable in general that not only do conferences need to be designed far, far in advance, but we need to be able to plan our attendance at them far, far in advance. Um, another theme was that waiting for access to vaccines to be more equitable um, came up. This also tied into costs. Um, digital was more affordable. It, you can stay in the comfort of your home. 
more people are able to afford it around the world this way, um, and more generally and predictably, there's less funding available for physical conferences nowadays. Um, and the environmental costs of conferences are high with or without COVID. There are location specific concerns um, now, vaccine rates, cultural factors and practices. Another major theme was that we, <laughs> given our field uh, in human computer interaction, we should be at the forefront of creating engaging virtual conferences to offset the wide range of concerns with in-person conferences today. Um, another theme was that there was unclear messaging from ACM and SIGCHI for planning purposes. Um, there's more, but I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna wrap this, tie this up, tie this up, we'll get to the brainstorming. And uh, just say that from that survey data and some of the conversations, we can't be comprehensive here or else I'll be talking for hours, but for hybrid to work, people have come together around the following points, which is that hybrid works because it gives people options for degrees and kinds of engagement, attendance and precaution. It allows participants to consent, as I said at the beginning. Um, for hybrid to work, people feel that we need to ensure masking, social distancing, rapid testing, and possibly vaccine mandates with reasoned exceptions. Um, this is a little bit outside of our hands and more in the hands of ACM for a host of reasons. Um, people came together around information on pandemic stats for physical sites before and after events being a really important point for them to be able to consent to one thing or another. Uh, there's communication around what precautions can and can't be taken on site and communicating that to uh, conference goers clearly and providing support for those who might get stuck due to travel restrictions, due to quarantine. Um, many individuals were asking for the events to be outdoors or in the very least ensuring ventilation with limited room capacity. Um, there are requests for access to vaccines and boosters um, lanyards that indicate if a person is immunocompromised and requires maintaining a distance. Um, yeah, and that is enough of me, I think, at this point. We have about 30 minutes allocated to hear further thoughts, um, considerations, and brainstorm. We're providing topics, which Neha will put in the chat right now to discuss. Um, and we'd like to ask you to, you know, offer your experiences with the rest of the room, but we'll be sharing a document where you can also just record thoughts, potential solutions, um, additional questions that we might be missing and should be asking. And so with all of that spiel said, um, the first that I think would be fruitful to explore is what values do we wish to see our future conferences embody? We'll get a little bit more specific after that with who are we thinking of when creating these hybrid conferences? Ourselves, others, both, the planet. Um, the third point is, what are the activities that we care about? Research, networking, both. I'm gonna guess the answer is all of them. Um, but right now there's a large ask for better solutions to networking through virtual platforms. Um, that's something I would like to at least dedicate five or 10 minutes to discussing. Um, and the last question that we're sort of brainstorming around is how do we realize conference futures that honor all of the above? So if there's anyone that would like to start us off, um, Rua. Hi, I have six minutes before I have to leave and go teach class. So okay, I just good work to um, thank the EC for inviting people to this. Um, I found out through Michael Miller and um, I just, I have a few key concerns. Uh, I fully support like making efforts to make hybrid events like the norm, but I have key concerns with that. Um, and the first one is that uh, the ACM conferences do not have a good track record of, of choosing accessible platforms. And so all technology involved in organizing hybrid events must be accessible. And this accessibility should be determined by a committee of qualified members of disability experts and not simply relying on the company says they are compliant. Uh, and that's a very key difference. Um, 
And that uh, my other major concern with hybrid events is that they cannot become a de facto segregation of disabled and otherwise marginalized attendees. So, in, so when I talk about access in this case, I mean uh, disability access and also financial access and other forms of access. So I also would hope that the um, we would not approve conferences to be hosted at sites where, for example, it was illegal to be queer and then say, oh, well, you can just attend virtually so that you don't get murdered. That's unacceptable. Um, and so that kind of issue of using hybrid as an excuse for segregation is something I'm very deeply concerned about. Um, and one way of mitigating that is that I would like to see the ACM establish a fund for supporting attendance at in-person events for people who otherwise would have had to choose hybrid um, because of financial reasons. And so specifically an, an anti-segregation fund. Uh, and so there are some other comments from people um, that expand on these points, but um, I, I'm gonna be done. Thank you. No, thank you. I think those are absolutely accurate. Um, yeah, if anyone else would like to actually build on that, um, speak to what values we wish to see our future conferences embody. Um, Neha, would you, do you feel you're in a position to sort of speak to where the EC is at with um, what Ru is saying? Sorry, I was monitoring the, uh, the, the document right now and just adding some clarifications there. Um, can you sum up the question? Briefly? I know that we've been talking on the EC about trying to secure um, pools of funding, for example, or whether it's like accessibility or any SIGTAI conference um, or like anti-segregation funding. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's uh, ready to talk about like publicly, but this is something we've been trying to put together. Yeah, so we do have uh, quite a bit of money devoted to community support, especially last year. Um, and for the ongoing year, we have most uh, of our budget basically dedicated to community support. And there's a lot in there that's still um, uh, uh, unused. And we are committed to using those funds for, um, you know, for supporting um, various accessibility needs, also um, participation from different communities and such. So that exists. Now, um, there are proposals that people can make, and we're open to those as well. Uh, everything, and I can post a link to this, people can apply through um, uh, submittable.com. But uh, there's also just, you know, if, if there are suggestions that we should be taking on and not uh, projects that people themselves would like to initiate, then we're also open to those. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of who are we thinking of ourselves, others, both the planet, is there anyone here that is directly just thinking of themselves? That's great. Um, I think where, yeah, sorry, just building one comment. Um, I think where we might find some good discussion is actually around how we can improve the sort of networking um, and connection that people want to feel through virtual conferences. Um, there's one comment being added to this document stating that networking is crucial for many and most, especially young researchers who are trying to build their connections. And that's something that you know came up a lot in the CHI 2022 survey. That's come up a lot in the conversations we've had with people. Um, and that's something that, you know, working as a past equity chair, I saw a lot of conference goers sort of 
disappointed by in their past like virtual conferences. Um, does anyone have any thoughts around what, and thank you Rua so much for showing up. Um, yeah, does anyone have any thoughts or past experiences where like virtual conferences have really come together around networking and that's played out particularly well? Um, I see, is it Heiko Mueller? Yes, yes, it's Heiko. Um, so yeah, my name is Heiko. Um, I'm from the University of Oldenburg in Germany. And um, I, I have just attended a, a hybrid conference um, as an online participant. And in a couple of weeks, I will be uh, in the opposite role. So I will be an on-site participant in a, in a hybrid conference. So for now, I can only speak of the, of the online experience that I had. And um, cons considering the, the networking, um, even though there was, there was quite an effort by the organizers to make like sessions such as uh, poster sessions where usually you, you have like uh, also like starting researchers uh, making connections just by discussing their ideas with, with the people that are passing by um, it was really strongly separated. Um, so um, while I was an online attendant waiting in, in the breakout room um, for somebody to show up and discuss the poster with me, and there was, there was just plain zero interaction. Um, so there's still, and this may be due to the conference schedule um, that was determined by some other things that um, the organizers didn't have any, any um, agency in, um, but uh, yeah, I think it will require a lot of thinking and time and, and allowing time for interactions um, that were, were more easily done when we had a fully online conference and um, don't, do not seem to work in the same way as we're going hybrid now. Thank you. Um, Hendrik, I see that you also have your hand up if you're wanting to build off of that point. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Hendrik. I'm one of the general chairs for the visualization conference. And uh, we are in a similar situation just half a year later than, than Kai. Um, and we were th thinking a lot around um, what is, what is, what is the, added value of an on-site conference. So what do you get on an on-site conference more out than in an, an online conference? And we have, we have all the feeling about that, but it's pretty hard to, to express what is really the, the thing. And I think networking is part of it. Um, I'm a big fan of what I would call low commitment uh, interactions. So we had some previous experience with on-site versions, what we call this buddies. So a senior member of the community and a couple of junior members of the community essentially signed a contract that they will meet for lunch uh, at the conference. But then you can be called out by name. Yeah. So if, you, if something comes in between, um, and this is something I'm, I'm not a big fan of. What I mean by uh, low contractual meetings is something we did virtually at um, some machine learning conferences where I was involved with. Um, we created a little platform called Mementor, where a senior member just said, tomorrow I have an hour of free time, here's my Zoom link. And we formalized it a little bit more so that, you know, like Zoom links are not floating on Twitter. <laughs> um, but uh, that was very well received, especially from, uh, from members of the communities who are from countries with uh, lower income um, Etc. So that's something I can definitely recommend. The good thing about this is you also have access to mid-career or senior members you might not have access to in an on-site event because quite often mid-career and senior people are running around from one meeting to the other, from one lunch to the other because it's their week. They meet, they meet each other again. Um, so in that case, online had, uh, I think has some benefit and you can replicate an, a low contract version of this as well. Think of an uh, AMA session, ask me anything session that you can hold on site and broadcast um, hybridly as well. So these are my two cents. No, that's fantastic. Um, I've actually 
I've heard from a couple other virtual conference organizers that really, really similar techniques are working quite well for them. Um, one of the barriers that has come up in a few conversations is like, it's actually quite social and anxiety based around feeling odd in terms of coming into a virtual room or entering a virtual space without like that direct invite. Um, that's something a few of us have been trying to think about how we can shift some norms around and wonder if that's maybe just like, you know, in cases where anxiety isn't involved um, on a more, yeah, personal level, if that's like just time within virtual conferences, we'll change that allowing so we can create all these virtual spaces, but having people feel comfortable entering them um, to discuss topics with basically strangers. Um, it's something I think we do anonymously quite well, but maybe within conferences, not as well. Has anyone seen within their virtual conferences um, other solutions um, in addition to say what Hendrik had just mentioned? Um, ways that we might create more comfort, um, security, safety, accessibility around the virtual spaces that allow for networking. Michael Mueller. Thank you. I have a half an, half an idea. Um, and it starts with a 1992 paper by Hill and Stornetta called Beyond Being There, in which they said of the very, very small scale online interactions, we're trying to approach face to face asymptotically in our digital mediations, and that's the wrong goal. We shouldn't be trying to, to achieve face-to-face. -face. We should be figuring out what the digital medium does for us that is different from face-to-face. -face. So starting from that point, it's still only a half an idea. Um, it occurs to me that if we are trying to do support networking at the conference, that makes the conference extraordinarily high stakes, especially for early career people. Maybe we could be supporting networking around the calendar so that by the time people get to the conference, they're already partially networked. At the publications board meeting, Julie, you are, I think, here. Um, we talked briefly about a program that's currently not being done, but maybe done again, the student reviewer mentoring program for CSCW. I'm, mentoring is a structured relationship, but that's not always the right structure. It's a structure that's available to us. My experience of mentoring is that the mentee is very shortly mentoring me and that it becomes co-mentoring. And from my point of view, that's a good thing. Other people will have different approaches to that. Um, so the half idea is what can we do in the other 11 months and three plus weeks when we're not at the conference of interest in order to strengthen networking, mentoring, a bunch of other relationships I can't think of um, during that time, which then takes the pressure off the conference as the big met, uh, networking opportunity and also strengthens a whole lot of horizontal connections that in fact we can't do at the conferences because there's not time, because people are too busy, because people can't afford to get there, or in my case, because people would die if they traveled to the conference and that would be my story. My story is just one person. I'm less concerned about that. I'm concerned about the health of the field and especially the health of the early career people's careers. So I'm going to stop talking because I am repeating myself. No, I think that's those are great, and that's a really it's a really concise way to actually bring together um, a lot of what we're working on establishing policies and tracks for right now through mentorship through like greater regional um, representation, um, creating more meetups and sort of like localized chapter strengthening. Um, I won't continue because I see that Sushil uh, has a hand up and then I'll turn it to Anne Schwartz Dronas. This is Sushil Oswald from the University of Washington, he, him. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for that uh, uh, suggestion, Michael. Uh, I think uh, another, uh, you know, major issue as uh, uh, the organizer summarized is uh, in hybrid conferences, how do you balance the needs of the people online and people uh, I think some of that is that uh, we are trying to add on accessibility to these online conferences. We really have not thought about how to uh, organically grow these conferences. And they were kind of a thrust on us because of COVID very quickly. Uh, but uh, if you look around uh, uh, and, you know, that's at CI. Uh, researchers and practitioners work that looking at different designs, uh, we will find some designs that work better in hybrid settings also. And uh, last thing I would say here is that uh, uh, yeah, when we are talking about uh, uh, hybrid conferences, uh, a lot of uh, attention is right now on uh, accessibility, uh, more related to disability. Uh, I was at a conference uh, last month. Uh, it's a business conference. What I saw was that the number of attendees was double of what this conference always fetches. It's a small conference and it's always held in uh, major tourist cities from Honolulu to you know Dublin. And uh, I actually asked in one session that why we are seeing some people, some colleagues who are published have seen names and but otherwise, and for women and men, who have household responsibilities, parents, or you know, taking care of their own parents. Uh, that's what I found out that uh, it was an opportunity for them. Otherwise, they were going to two or three conferences a year. Now they can go to additional couple of conferences. Thank you. Thanks, Ishiel. Um and would you like to take build on that? Thank you. I'm Ann Schwartz Dravnes. I'm the director of the Computing Community Consortium with the CRA. Um, and we've been looking at a lot of these same issues. And something I wanted to share, Michael, um, I loved everything you said about, you know, if we're feeling we have to be in person is for the networking, particularly for the junior people in our community, because that's what we're hearing is they're really missing out. But the senior people also, it's suddenly their time to get together too, so they may not be as accessible. Trying to do more throughout the year, um, I complete and not necessarily making the conference the place for that to happen. On the one hand, I completely agree with that. But on the other hand, it is so incredibly hard. And I wanted to share my experience as we recently have run the Computing Innovation Fellows Program, which is a set of postdocs funded by the National Science Foundation because when the job market tanked at the onset of the pandemic and so forth. So I have a cohort of students, well, now graduates um, as postdocs that are funded by me and we're creating cohort building activities and so forth. And we've got a rather large number, not numbers of Kai, Kai but you know, 130 fellows and maybe 40 people attend the cohort building events that are intended to help them build their career. And it's probably, you know, the same 30 and then 10 change monthly. But we also listened and the feedback came out, we're missing opportunities to network with senior people in the field. So then we provided that. We provided our long meetups with a few senior researchers and anyone who wanted to come. And we did them at all hours of the day, at different days of the week to try to accommodate. And I, we got maybe 10 people coming. 
And so, and the numbers went down as it went on more. And here was an opportunity for you to really get to talk to senior people in the field in small groups. Um, even if it was 30 people and we had three senior researchers, it's still an opportunity. And then we created breakout rooms. So A, I then feel, did these senior researchers feel that this is a waste of their time? Not to mention all the overhead that it is on the people trying to put this together to create all these modalities for it to not necessarily work out because when you're at a conference, hopefully you're there. You can ignore the kids at home. You can ignore the teaching responsibilities. You can ignore the office hours and you can focus and you can take those 10 extra minutes to sit and chat with someone. Whereas even if you try to accommodate all of that with different hours of the day, different days of the week, different people, different topics, it's just something easy to put off and then it doesn't happen. Perfect. Yeah. Um, just to catch us up a little bit. Thank you so much, by the way. Um, I think that's actually something a lot of organizers of those smaller events are. Yeah, we are hearing that as a major barrier as well, right? Where we're spread so thin. There's so many things. We only have so many spoons and how we're allocating those is. It feels impossible. I mean, for myself, at least at this point. Um, and that's something that actually ties into what Nick, Bid Nick Bidwell wanted us to at least be able to think about at this meeting, um, which has to do with these intersections of sustainability, not only environmentally, but like um, personally, socially, organizationally, um, how there are trade-offs, for example, where people feel they're making compromises to their own careers, their own enjoyment. Um, how we orient ourselves around adaptability to these times, how we like afford time and space away while also wanting to engage more on a more permanent level year round. Many smaller conferences versus one bigger one, like there's a lot of dynamics here at play. I'm wondering actually, Neha, do you think it would be better to read some of the comments, read aloud some of what people are writing in this brainstorming document or shift the sort of like SIG governing board goals. So we have time to talk a bit more about those. Yeah, um, I would say that we could read a few more of the comments here. I think we have time to um, to then go into the SIG governing board conversation and that is going to link to, uh, to this anyway. Um, okay. Yeah. So to, yeah, return to the comments a little bit here. Cassia had written, um, I'm hoping in the next years, maybe months, there will be new online platforms and tools that can better support the sense of communality and other conference-like experiences, such as serendipitous meetings. Um, even if we cannot fully integrate online and in-person tracks within a conference, I believe the online experiences can get better in the future. Still, I strongly believe we occasionally need in-person events and that hybrid is the best new normal. Um, Victoria Newman added, so, is the feeling is the common feeling that the change needs to be from low commitment interaction to high commitment interaction to create networking online slash hybrid. Christian um, had added, I don't know of any conference platform that is accessible yet. It's one of the major reasons assets 2021 is stuck with Zoom. Um, and Zulema, I believe, I hope I pronounced that correctly, has added analogy building a water supply system in a community does not warrant that all will access it if some do not know how or have no resources to buy accessories to access it. First, we may ask if those graduates feel they lack the skills to network aside from access to networking opportunities, which I think is a great point and ties us back into the need for mentorship and sort of like community building and community guidance. Um, if there's no one else that would like to add something um, by speaking to it. I can try and actually, um, Sushil, if you're able to just sort of like add a concise point, that would be great. Yeah, I would. I just was uh, responding to what you just said that uh, uh, possibly at the next conference, there could be some sessions that are 
geared toward uh, training people on how to how to function in these online spaces at conferences. Thanks. I think that's important. Um, Michael Mueller, would you like to add? Very quickly, um, there have been really successful multi-day small conference workshop sorts of things that have gone on for five or six weeks, one day a week, um, organized largely from the young feminist community in, in, in Europe and, and the UK. And so um, successful approaches exist and, and we shouldn't be telling ourselves that, that virtual doesn't happen, that networking doesn't happen around virtual events. We don't yet have the right platform for a large virtual event, but we're the right community, as you said earlier, Kale, we're the right community to design and build that platform someday. So of course, it, of course it's not right now. We've only been doing this for two years, but it, it's a lovely research challenge to stop talking, Michael. I'll stop talking. I'm sorry, that was me saying stop talking, but I'm still gonna stop talking. No, and I think I think that is the point. It's a it's an incredibly impactful research challenge. Um, that has to start with being sort of like community informed, data informed, right? Um, we do have about twenty minutes left, and I want to make sure that we have time to sort of talk about two of our other primary questions that Neha was going to bring up. Um, sure. So should I just go over the, uh, the SIG governing board exercise that I was hoping we could do? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, this is just to mention that the, the SIG governing board, which looks at all of the SIGs um, across the ACM, is planning to conduct a meeting across uh, the SIG, so with the participation of SIG leaders, to discuss the future of conferences um, within the ACM. So looking specifically at what happens now that we're uh, moving towards more hybrid and more virtual conferences. And I've shared here in the document the survey prompt that uh, SIG plan had used. And it doesn't really apply to us because we have many more conferences. We have about 24 and they have five. Um, but they did, uh, they basically asked this question to their membership of whether uh, they wanted, whether the community wanted to go back to business as usual. So that's BBU, alternate uh, physical and virtual conferences. Um, that's uh, alt, go big with a single annual physical conference plus four virtual ones. So anyway, these are the questions that, that they were uh, posed, but we might want to ask our membership different questions. And so I was uh, hoping that we could have maybe a little bit of discussion around what questions we want to be asking our community um, for the conferences. And this is both to, to be able to provide this um, as guidance to our conferences, but also to be able to have the discussion at the ACM level. So you can put your thoughts in the chat. You can put them um, in, the, uh, in the document. Brad, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to what Nia just said that um, I think all of our conferences are so are different communities and it would be really inappropriate to have a survey of that style where people are voting that other people should have the hybrid conference or whatever they think is the worst uh, option where their community should have the better option. Um, yeah. So I, I I don't see any value in a, um, a survey like that. I, mm -hmm. I guess the only interesting distinction is the CHI conference for everyone versus the 23 smaller conferences. Um, mm -hmm. That might be a useful distinction, but I don't think we want to start distinguishing modalities between the smaller conferences. Mm -hmm. Yep, noted. And that's very true. I think some of the things we've talked about today probably apply across conferences, but maybe we don't want to make decisions that are um, for all of our conferences together. Um, 
any other suggestions? And if not, Kale, we can continue to maybe read from the um, from the chat because there's a few more comments there. Yeah, um, I was just going to really quickly highlight from the chat that there's discussion around you know looking at the larger systemic factors around using open source or not um, platforms, what that means, where that takes us. We have um, a comment from Amy saying, from my studies within health informatics, a new role is seeming to develop in importance. And that's the IT coordinator, a liaison who bridges the gap between siloed in-person experiences from the siloed virtual experience. This person should be within the in-person space, but focused on connecting the virtual audience. They could possibly be a contact point for invitations to diminish the awkwardness of entering into virtual meetups, which was previously mentioned. Essentially, this person would be the voice of the virtual attendee within the in-person conference, just like how Neha has been moderating for us here. Can interfaces within online conference be an effective liaison or will this have to be a person? I think that's a great question. And another thing that we have heard different members of the community discuss. Um, so creating less disparity between virtual space and in-person space, making it truly more hybrid, um, as well as to go back to what was actually just mentioned um, out loud of like venue by venue, locale to locale, conference by conference needs um, for their attendees. I think that, yeah, that personalized touch is really important. Stacy's added, I think the important takeaway for me, having seen the use of some of these open source platforms to date, is we should not adopt them prior to accessibility features being implemented. That comes from a lot of experience on Stacy's end. Um, in the case of Midspace, they promised to have auto captioning integrated prior to CSCW 21, but did not come through. So having requirements in the contract um, or having features implemented before signing on to the platform is key. Um, Cliff, I see that you have your hand up if you'd like to jump in here. Yeah, I just want to react to Hendrick's question because it's really, really good, right? Which is basically, what's the financial and volunteer sustainability of these hybrid models? Um, having just come from a CHI 2022 budget meeting, uh, like it's a tough one and I'm not sure we know the answer yet, right? Like the, we're running basically two conferences with some intersection here, um, but we don't have two conferences worth of revenue. So like, it's going to be very expensive hub. It, oh, shoot. I just said what out loud what our platform is. The platform that we are going to use is very expensive. Um, the uh, uh, other systems that we use to run Kai, the in-person experience is very expensive. All of these things are very expensive to run. And on top of that, like, I don't want to use volunteer time for things that aren't intellectually or organizationally rewarding. So like I try, we try to pay for things where paying for things makes sense. So it's, you know, I don't know is my really dodgy answer to Hendrick's question, because I think it's um, something we're going to be finding out over the next two years about what's, what are the kind of cost implications of hybridity? Uh, how can we resolve those cost implications? How can we make life easier for our volunteers as we figure out what our pain points are? So the important thing was, um, the important thing I think is to really measure and, and keep the, the flow of information going because it's gonna be an interesting learning experience. So there's a totally unsatisfying answer for you, sorry. Uh, if, if I may respond directly, uh, it's not unsatisfying. I'm in the same boat for another conference. And um, so our AV costs pot potentially will triple uh, if you want to support uh, hybrid setups and have to have a live feeling with it. So. Uh, yeah, we we'll probably do the same. Thing. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would like to sort of comment on either the question, you know, what questions should we be asking our community that we haven't been? Um, especially if we're trying to be sort of evidence-based uh, in all of our practices and sort of what would you like us to communicate to the ACM if you could about hybrid events? Perfect. If there's anyone um, 
Michael, I want to turn to you uh, just before though, if there's anyone that hasn't had a chance to speak that would like to speak on any of the topics that we've brought up at any point, um, this, is, this is your big golden opportunity. And if not, then yeah, I'll pass it off to Michael. All right, I think the floor is yours, Michael. I've been thinking, uh, is the need to be evidence-based or inspiration-based? I think if we talk with our membership and ask for brainstorming, we can move toward new ideas rather than evidence about existing ideas. Um, sorry to go all participatory design or value-sensitive design on you all or action research on you all, but I think that's the path forward. I mean, off the top of my head, I can't see anyone protesting to both inspirational and evidence-based. <laughs> Por que no los dos? Um, yeah, from the comments here, I'm seeing actually quite a lot about constraints platform. Um, we'll incorporate these into the document and this document will remain open and accessible at least for a little bit. Um, I wanted to remind everyone while we have about nine minutes left, that there will be a series of posts going out over the next bit. So not only will the EC here be communicating with different conference organizers to look at what's possible, um, support new and innovative sort of solutions to these things, help make them more sustainable, accessible, safe, um, less discriminatory, uh, but we'll have conference specific blogs um, on a sort of per conference basis um, coming out of this. So everything that's in chat, we'll try and preserve in some form or another. Uh, Cliff in chat has added, I think it's going to take a few years to socialize ACM to the idea of how we can do some of these things. Um, for example, it's much cheaper to buy omnidirectional microphones than to rent them, but that's an exception to ACM rules. Um, I go, I see that you've had to leave. Uh, thank you so much for coming and offering your thoughts. Uh, Cliff has said most conference organizers don't pick their cities, the steering committees do, for Sekai at least. That's an important thing we're trying to communicate with the audience, or well, the community as well, is how many decision-making processes and governing bodies are involved with all of these decisions. And that's a difficult thing to navigate, especially when we're trying to abide by bylaws and policy. Um, Brad, I see that you have your hand up. I, I just had a quick question. Has it been definitively decided that Kai will have an in-person component for 22? Unless something significantly changes in the, like if there's, I don't even wanna say it out loud, but like a Lambda variant or something like that that comes along, yes, we are moving full steam ahead with planning an in-person portion of the conference, as well as a really strong online portion of the conference. Awesome, thank you, Cliff. Um, and Pat, is there, is there anything within the last couple minutes that we have here while this line of communication is open that you would like the EC here to communicate to the ACM? Um, about hybrid events. And if no one has anything that does just make my job easier. Um, Kave, I believe you have your hand up here. Yes, this is Kave speaking from Tehran. Just wanted to say that I had the chance to participate in a conference called uh, Advancing Research uh, Managed by Rosenfield Media. And it was really great, uh, all in terms of interaction and networking, everything. I would strongly recommend that uh, whoever is in the executive committee would have a look at what Rosenfield Media is doing. I'm going to share the link in the discussion and thank you very much uh, for all the insights that have been shared tonight over and out thank you so much um
Christian has added in chat, I think it bears repeating that we should try to play to the strengths of each medium and not mash them up willy nilly. <laughs> and <laughs> does anyone want to try and actually define willy nilly? I find that word so funny and I can only hear my past roommate, Max in a thick German accent saying like willy nilly. And um, I only, <laughs> yeah, this is an aside, so sorry. Um, yeah, anything else that you'd like to have communicated to the ACM about hybrid events? I think the hard part here might be to figure out even what is a good thing to communicate, right? I mean, we're still figuring out so many, um, so many details. So I think we can leave that as an ongoing conversation and maybe start to wrap up. We have about four minutes. If there's anyone um, in the next maybe two minutes that has any final thoughts about anything that we've discussed, this obviously isn't the first and will not be the last um, space for yeah, discussing hybrid events. Um, but if no one has anything else that they would like to explicitly add, I think we can begin to wrap this up, mostly by saying thank you so much to every single person who has showed up, put in that time and labor. Um, I know we're all volunteers here. I know things are hard and exhausting and we're all overworked actually at this point. Um, as we work on building better hybrid conferences, the EC at least will do everything that they can to keep communicating sort of what it is that we've learned, what it is that we've heard. Um, establishing better lines of communication and contact with, you know, general chairs, steering committees and ACM um, and keeping those lines open and transparent. So thanks for bearing with us through all the transitions involved with that. Um, yeah, Neha, any final thoughts? Nope, we can end three minutes early or well, we'll be here, but people are welcome to leave. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much.